What's up, everybody? Thank you for listening to the WhatCast. Boy, am I excited for this show tonight, Mike. You tell me you have some dragon legends to talk about. Yeah, dude. Fucking dragon legends. Woohoo! We did a dragon show a long time ago, and it was about more of uh, dragons existing in today's time and dragon bones, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, there were... um... I, I can't remember where it was, but it was it was proven to be a hoax in the end anyway, but it looked really cool. It sure did. But I've got some some old yeah, I mean I would say they're old legends. But when when you think of the term dragon, like what's what what's what do you picture? Like what's the what pops into your head? The classic European giant winged fire breathing dragon, much in the vein of that what was it, early 2000s movie, Reign of Fire? Oh, shit. Yeah, I actually yeah. never saw that movie. I always wanted to watch what? it. What? It was, it's, yeah. a, it's a goofy fucking movie. never saw it. Oh, I'm sure it's goofy as all hell. Yeah. I mean, Matthew McConaughey kills a dragon by jumping off a roof of a building with an axe. It's, you know, but it's still cool to watch. Wonderful. That's awesome. Well, the the reason I ask is because there's there's a few different types of dragons that you find in mythology. And they're all, I, I guess, in a way, considered dragons. But um, you, you've got the classic medieval European dragon, the the winged beast with four legs and breathing fire covered in scales. Um, and then you've got the familiar Asian dragon, which is like the long serpent thing with, it's got the four legs, but there's no wings and it's got like whiskers and long body, long tail, long neck. Also scaled, though. But then there's... Do you consider... Because some people do, some people don't. Do you consider the tales of sea serpents, like giant sea serpents, to be to be a type of dragon? Uh, Traditionally, no. These are land-based creatures in my mind. I mean, there's water so dragons. So no ocean dragons. Yeah, I'm sure there's... I mean, I I know that there's things called water dragons and things that would yeah. could be considered aquatic dragons, but mm. in the classical sense, no, I see a guy in armor fighting this thing. Okay. All right, because a lot of people consider the old-timey sea serpents to be sorts of dragons, Ooh. and I'm going to kind of get into that a little bit too, but... I just I was curious where you fell on that, but then there's there is the wyvern, or I, I think sometimes it's pronounced wyvern. I always pronounced it wyvern, so that's what I'll be calling it. But that is also considered a dragon, and in, in some of the legends they kind of go hand in hand. But but traditionally, the wyvern or wyvern is a two legged dragon, like it, it looks like a dragon, but it's got two hind legs that it walks around on and wings and the tail has a, a typically a venomous stinger on it but it gets used a lot in a lot of heraldry and and it's seen on on some older flags in the middle ages um but the, but the idea of the wyvern was actually based on uh a, an encounter by the roman emperor trajan I think that's a Trajan, Trajan. I don't know. We'll say we'll say it's Trajan because that sounds fancy. Yeah, I like so it. So Emperor Emperor Trajan um, was leading his legions of troops through uh, through Dacia, which is a place uh, that was inhabited by a group of people they referred to as the Dacians. But he was he was going through their lands, and they encountered this dragon that had two legs, wings, and a tail. And so from this from this alleged sighting, uh, the design for the wyvern sprung up. So th- that was, I mean, when Trajan was, was the Roman emperor, this was in 
the year 98. So this is going <laughs> way back. Yeah, no shit. I was going to yeah. say, I know, at least in art, traditionally, Scandinavian dragons have only front legs and sometimes no legs at all. They're, they're dragons. Right. Yeah. And so, so that's a different sort of dragon, which I'll also be talking about, called the, the Lindworm or the Lindorm. Yes. Um, and we, we've discussed the Tatzel Worm before, and that's grouped into that category. Nice. Yeah. So that's a, a whole other type of, of dragon or dragon like creature. So there's there's a, a a wide array of dragons. And and for any any D and D nerds out there, you know that there are among the uh, in the in the D and D monsters manual, there's dozens of different types of dragons based on color. Um you know, dependent on the color, it, their breath weapon is different and some shoot lightning, some shoot fire, some shoot acid, some shoot a cloud of poison gas. There's some that can like shoot a uh, uh, frost out of their mouth, and some that'll that'll slow you down by breathing on you. Like all sorts of crazy breath weapons. It's fucking awesome. And if you're a shadow run nerd, dragons run the governments of the world. Maybe if you're also a David Icke nerd, dragons run the world. <laughs> Touche, touche, very good. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I mean, we just did a, a show on reptoids not too long ago, so we're all we're all familiar with the with the dragons running the world sort of situation. But uh, the I I really feel like, uh, and, and this is also why I asked you earlier about um, whether you consider sea serpents to be dragons, and and the reason I ask is because in the Bible. Leviathan is referred to as a dragon. Right. And it's it's a dragon. It's said to be a dragon that's in the sea. Uh, but this dragon is like it, they they even reference in the I think in the book of Isaiah, um, they reference that the Leviathan eats other dragons. So they reference other dragons there too, but this this is like the dragon of all dragons. And in the Bible, it's it's said to have these glowing eyes, and it it says it has more than three hundred eyes in total. Ooh. So like it almost sounds like something Lovecraftian, right? Right you know, out of the gate, this huge, long coiled body with three hundred eyes, covered in overlapping scales, and it's able to when it writhes and thrashes in the ocean it creates a bubbling that that resembles a boiling cauldron and it was said that no mortal weapon could penetrate the scales of the leviathan it prophecy said that it would live until the end of time at which point the angel gabriel would would finally kill it and the faithful of god would feast on its flesh Ew, I don't want to eat sea dragon meat if I you know, if I was a faithful to God. I'm what well, let's say what they would consider to be faithful to God. Right, right. Well, it, I mean it's it's going to provide wonderful s- sustenance for you. I better get some superpowers. I mean, if if the a dragon appears and it dies and they offer it to me, I'm going to eat it. I don't know what that's going to mean, but I'll eat it, you skip it. We'll see what happens and if I grow horns and start to fly. I'll call you, and then you eat some. I'll I'll snack on it. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a scurd. It'll be like a cool, pixelated altered beast transformation. It's a fat bearded <laughs> podcaster guy just oh turns into a dragon. Rise from the grave and rescue <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. But the 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 Leviathan itself was it was a creature that was intentionally created by God. And initially in, in uh, some of the early, uh, early books of the Bible. And I think it's also in, in the apocryphal book of Enoch. Um, I can't remember exactly which book references this, but um, when God was creating everything, I I think he created um, on the fifth day, was the day that he created um, the creatures of the sea. And this was when the dragon Leviathan 
was created and and he was created to be basically like the king of the ocean animals like he above all animals leviathan was king but with with all animals that that god made initially there was a pair of them so that they could reproduce but god saw how powerful these beings were and that if he were to let them procreate that they would destroy everything and basically eat everything in the ocean and and maybe even on land or or you know who who knows what they would be capable of if they started breeding so with that in mind god destroyed one of them and in destroying one of them he granted the other immortality and this is where this is why its its flesh cannot be penetrated until the end of time when the angel gabriel will will destroy it to to feed the faithful um but but this kind of mirrors this sort of uh giant dragon or serpent that is bested by some sort of uh divine being um th- th- this is this is seen over and over again in in history and mythology in mesopotamian uh i believe it it's babylonian specifically and um there's the legend of Tiamat and Marduk and Tiamat was this dragon queen that uh she gave birth to all the monsters of earth and and the god Marduk had to destroy her and and stop her her uh, offspring from killing everybody else and he ends up killing Tiamat and creating the world from Tiamat so the world that that we all live on was created after he split Tiamat in two and out of the two halves created the world as we know it. Um, but that's also repeated again in uh, the Canaanite religion, which was it was it was a religion that was practiced during the Bronze Age um, in the areas around in the Middle East, like around uh I think like where Syria and Iraq is now. Um, But they had a monster called Lotan, which was a sea god, or it was the the servant of the sea god named Yam. And at one point, Lotan, the the sea dragon, uh, was in a battle against the god uh, Baal Hadad, who is the storm god. So the storm god was at war with the sea god and destroyed his servant, the great dragon. And then later we see Thor defeating Yamungandr. And then in 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 uh, Hindu mythology, the being Indra uh, defeated the great dragon Vritra, who was this this demon um, and constant like enemy or nemesis to Indra. Um, but he appeared as a dragon who would block the flow of rivers. And in order to stop him from blocking the, the life giving waters of the river, Indra had to kill him. So it's this sort of, um, this, this sort of hero slaying the dragon to either save mankind or create the world. We see that over and over again. And it's kind of, I think this sort of thing is also where the idea of the snake in the Garden of Eden comes from, just because uh, the symbology behind it in a lot of ways uh, kind of mirrors, except for the fact that the serpent in the Garden of Eden is considerably smaller. But we know from from some of the uh, Apocrypha and and early Jewish writing that um, the the serpent initially had limbs. So w- was it a type of dragon that then became a snake after it got its limbs removed? Well, you mentioned a rather small dragon earlier, one from the lumber woods. Yeah, the 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 tatzel worm. Right, Satan yeah. is a tatzel worm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe tatzel worms really are just the the spawn of Satan. Yep, that's why those lumberjacks hunted them all down. <laughs> Get out of here, you roly-poly demon. Yeah, you got to kill them off. 
but the with with the Leviathan in kind of in a similar vein, but um a different sort of creature, but but still considered by some to be a dragon is is the behemoth, which is another one of these immortal beasts that's said to feed the faithful at the end of time. Oh, I gotta eat another beast? Yeah. I mean you get your choice. It's it's surf and turf. Leviathan <laughs> or behemoth. <laughs> which what's what do you pick? Shit. Yeah. I'm in California, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's all that's sounding weirder and weirder. That's the stuff yeah. they don't mention in Sunday school. And in the end, you have to eat a giant fish monster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you remain faithful to God, you get to mow on that fish monster. And maybe the big fat land monster. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, I can't wait, oh, my kid. So, with, with all that in mind, maybe maybe the old, the, the sea serpents of old were just like the, the offspring or the, the, I shouldn't say the offspring because God killed the other one, but maybe like some sort of uh, weird mutation that kind of mimics the Leviathan. Maybe. I mean, you mentioned that the Bible said that it eats other dragons. Apparently there's tons of, well, maybe not yeah. tons, but other types of not, dragons. Well, well, I mean, this thing was eating the dragons, so who knows? And oh. Maybe it ate all the dragons, and that's why there's no dragons. I don't. I don't recall reading about Noah taking dragons on board <laughs> the the ark. So I'm pretty sure if he did, the dragons would have fucked everything up and made life miserable and short lived for everybody on board. Yeah, he just showed up with two dragons. He heard a voice, bro. No, not those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And thus God spoke. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of uh, speculation on on if this was a real thing, um, what what it was, and there there's some some scholars that actually think that this is a perhaps a Nile crocodile, which would have been living in the area uh, in biblical middle east during that time um now nile crocodiles get they're big they're like 20 feet long they've got huge teeth just like the leviathan has said and they've got they produce eye shine if there's light reflected on their eyes so that could maybe account for the glowing eyes but they don't have 300 eyes and they're definitely not big enough to eat a dragon right so i think that's pretty silly and then there's other speculation that says that they were talking about a whale. And whales do have sharp teeth. Um, oh, another part, another thing for the Leviathan is that it shoots steam out of its nostrils. And so a, a whale with a blowhole could give off that illusion. But right. whales don't have sparkly eyes. They don't have a 300 eyes unless they're counting barnacles. You know, maybe they saw these barnacles on top of the whale and it caught the light a certain way. So it's like, oh, my God, that whale has 300 eyes. Or even if they saw it in broad daylight, that would look like a bunch of eyes. That's yeah, yeah, very interesting. Could. Yeah. So I don't know. But but most whales that have teeth, they're not the big ones. Like, you know, the biggest whales, like the blue whale and the, the humpback whale, they, they're baleen whales. So they don't have these huge teeth yeah that was god's so. cap after leviathan the big yeah. ones get no teeth yeah yeah he's like you know what i learned my lesson <laughs> so i i don't know man i i i th to me it just sounds like it's it's an echo of the uh the the legends that that are repeated throughout throughout history and throughout different cultures and you know when we're we're looking at Babylon and Mesopotamia, and that's pretty close to the area that the Bible took place in. So it's it would make sense that there would be some carryover um, between some of these legends, and especially when a new religion is developing in a in an area where there's existing beliefs and existing mythology and tales, it would make sense to have this sort of thing repeat again. Mm -hmm. So it it could just be a a retelling for a new age of this of this story, but 
you know, that's that's just one type of dragon. There's there's plenty other dragons. So even if this one is is just a biblical myth and there's nothing to it, we still have the Lindorm or Lindworm or you know whatever you want to call it, the the Tatzel Worm. The it's so the the way that it's described is that it's got a serpent like body. Typically, it's described as having a dragon's head. It's covered in scales, and it's got two front forelimbs that are, have claws on it. Um, it's it's known primarily in Scandinavian countries and Sweden. Um, Sweden is is the the place where it's really uh, the legend of the Lindorm really uh, kind of comes to life. But there's. Uh, there was a belief at one point, and and I I do want to point out that there was actually um, belief that this was a real thing as late as the eighteen uh, eighties. Right. So this is something that was really thought to be have been a living thing, and there's there's lots of different stories and and myths about it, and I'll I'll get into a few of those in a few minutes, but. Um, it's said that the Lindorms would sometimes invade churches and they would take over the churchyard and which traditionally the churchyard would be, would be the graveyard for the local parish. And it would take over the churchyard and dig up the bodies that were buried there and (laughs) eat them. And eat them? Yes. Damn. Yeah. It would just dig them up. Mow them down. That's and, rough. Uh, I mean, they're, they're already dead. It's better than going into the village and eating living people, you know? Yeah, but can you just imagine walking out of church, hearing yeah. some loud commotion just outside? Just on a Sunday, like, la, la, la. And they're like, oh, my God, it's eating grandma. <laughs> no. It's just dug up five graves and it's <laughs> eating on the fifth body. Yeah. And you're like, it, oh, my God. Yeah, screw honey badger. Lindorm doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> He'll fucking he'll eat your grandma and then shit on her grave when he's done, <laughs> and move on to your next relative. Yeah, and then move on. He's like, "Oh shit, grandpa's down here too." Fuck yeah, <laughs> fuck yeah, and fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> what you gonna do about it? <laughs> yeah. So Lindorm's an asshole, or the Lindworm, but um, there there was in Austria they thought that they had found um. A skeleton of a Lindorm Ooh. in 1335. And it was eventually discovered that it wasn't a Lindorm. It was actually the skull of a woolly rhinoceros. Oh. But at the time, they had never seen a woolly rhinoceros. So like, fuck, it's a Lindorm skull. I knew it was real. God damn it. Right. Yeah. That would have been pretty massive, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, woolly rhinoceroses are fucking huge. But they, I mean, throughout most of these stories, the the Lindworm itself is a big, big asshole. Um, in also in the 1300s, there's there's a tale from Austria uh, where there was flooding along the river, and it was threatening the the flood was was covering roads that were well traveled, and was preventing people from traveling in the area. And this flood was being blamed on the lindworm. Somehow it had blocked the the flow of the river and the uh, the water was coming up and, and flooding the roads. So the local duke offered a reward to anyone that was willing to capture it or kill it. So some young men decided to take a bull, tie it to a chain, and bring it to the edge of the river. And when the the idea was that they would use the the bull as a lure and use it to hook the lindworm, those dummies. Um, he can't use a cow. He needs to use some corpses. You no, know, well, it the the bull worked and the the lindworm attacked, Ooh. swallowed the bull, and ended up getting hooked on mm. the bull's horns. Nice. And they were able to pull it out of the river and they killed it. Ooh. And it was believed that if you were to be able to kill a lindworm. Um, and skin it, or if you were to find the shed skin of a lindworm, that whoever found it or was in possession of it 
their knowledge about nature and medicine would increase like magic. Fuck yeah. So if you ever see a, a lindworm, steal its skin. <laughs> There's another legend of of a lindworm. Um, this is called the Lambton worm, who was a serpent that was caught in the river Weir or Ware um, in northeast England. Actually so caught? I, yeah, he caught it. Um, it was actually a nobleman who was also a crusader, so I, I guess he would be a knight. Or I don't know if he was a knight, but he was a warrior fighting in the Crusades, but he was a nobleman. And he caught it and dropped it in a well, and it lived for three or four years in the well. And while he was away in the Crusades, um, this this uh, lindworm would come out of the well and terrorize the countryside of Durham. But once he came back, he had uh, he realized he had he had to kill it because it was now terrorizing everyone who lived in the area and it was his fault because he caught it and put it in the well for some reason um so his father had made these arrangements for him so that he could get this spiked armor and specific instructions for how to kill the lindworm but for some reason as part of the agreement to get the spiked armor he had to kill the next living thing he saw after killing the serpent so his father was helping him out and made these arrangements so that a dog would be released as soon as he killed the lindworm and so that he would kill the dog. But for some reason, instead of releasing the dog, his father was so pumped that he killed the dragon that his father ran over to his son. And uh, the story says that he refused to commit suicide and as a result brought a curse down upon their whole family Oh, because he wouldn't kill his father. And, uh, so, or commit suicide. Yep. So curse upon the family. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, there's the story. I don't know if this is, I, I'm not really sure exactly where the story comes from. Um, but it, it, there's a fairy tale called Prince Lindworm. And this is kind of similar to the, the story of the frog prince. Um, but the story goes that there was a queen in, this is a a Swedish story. Um, so there was a queen in Sweden who was, who had been trying to have a child for, for many years. And, and she ended up going to see, um, a fortune teller who told her as soon as she got back, if she were to eat two onions that she would give birth to two sons. So immediately the queen goes back, and she's so excited by, by this prophecy that she eats one onion without peeling it at all, just mouths it right down. <laughs> Ew. And then she looks at the next one, and she's like, maybe it would have been a good idea to peel it. So she peels the next one and then eats it after peeling it. And just as the fortune teller told her, she became pregnant, and the day arrived when she was to give birth. And the, as she's giving birth to the first son, the castle hears the screams coming from her bedchamber. But it's not the screams of the mother giving birth. It's the screams of the midwife who's attending to her. And apparently the story goes that she gave birth to this scaly serpent thing with a dragon's head. And two two clawed forearms, but no legs, no wings. And the midwife was so repulsed by it, she wouldn't go near the mother. So the mother, who had just given birth to this thing and was still having another baby inside of her, uh, got up from her, her birthing bed, grabbed the fucking serpent, and threw it out the window. <laughs> yes. And at that point, it slithered off into the woods. Now, many years went by, and uh, she had given birth to to the second son. Uh, they were they were twins, and uh, the the son had become of age to get married. So his wife star- or his mother starts making arrangements for him to meet the the local ladies. But when the time came for him to actually start meeting the women, 
his brother, the fucking Lindworm, comes crawling out of the woods and tells him that he's not going to marry anyone until they find a suitable mate for the Lindworm. But the the deal is that they can't find they can't force a woman into being his mate. The the deal is that the woman has to come willingly to him and uh mate with him or or you know marry him or whatever. <laughs> so they can't find anyone who's willing. Everyone's like, "No, I don't want to marry a fucking dragon man." And he's like, "Oh man, sucks being a dragon man. I didn't ask for this shit. My mom made it." I mean, and didn't peel it, <laughs> fucking bitch. <laughs> and so finally, uh, there's a, a local woman who met with the same fortune teller that the Lindworm's mother met with all that time before. And she didn't want to marry the Lindworm, but she talked to the fortune teller, and the fortune teller whispered something in her ear. And upon whispering this, the woman became happy and and agreed to marry the Lindworm. So they get married, and the the uh, time comes for them to consummate the marriage. Now, that might be a little bit difficult, considering she is a human, and the Lindworm is, you know, a dragon beast. So she, on their wedding night, she arrives to their bedchamber, and she's wearing like a thousand dresses. Not literally a thousand, but she's wearing like so many dresses. And she makes an agreement with the lindworm saying, for every dress I take off, I want you to take off a layer of skin. So she takes off her first dress. The lindworm sheds out of its first layer of skin. She takes off her second dress. The lindworm takes off its second layer of skin. And on and on until finally she just has her plain undergarments on and... and he has this thin kind of glistening skin left. He had shed all his, all his other skin. So the time comes for her to take off her final undergarments and, and stand naked before her lizard man husband. <laughs> and so she, she takes off her last bit of clothes and she's standing there and lizard man is gawking at her, licking his creepy lizard lips. And, and then she's like, tut, tut, tut. You've got one more layer of skin to take off, sir. So he takes off his last layer of skin and when he does this like mist comes out and she can feel this creepy lizard man holding her and this mist is just coming out. She can't see him anymore but she can still feel that he's holding her in his arms and then as the mist clears it's revealed that he's now a handsome prince. Billy Zane. Yeah, it's Billy Zane himself. Standing there holding her, and he's like, Hey, baby, I'm Billy Zane. She's like, I'm Jackpot. Yep, yeah. I I thought it was going to be a lizard man, but it's not. It's Billy fucking Zane. <laughs> and the prophecy that was told to her, that was whispered to her, was if she were to do this and marry the lindworm and go through this thing to turn him back into a human, that she would then give birth to two sons. And they would all be exceedingly wealthy and rich and royal. Um, so she, and you know, now that he's a human, she can she can have some sexual relations with him, and then she eats the onions. But she remembers this time to peel the onion, and she gives birth to two beautiful twin boys. Oh, there should have been a twist, like a Greek tragedy twist that. It didn't matter what type of onion she ate. The father was a fucking lindworm. And yeah, she... <laughs> well, the father ate the children and then shit all over her bed. <laughs> so you know, I told you they were assholes. Yeah, yeah, I told you. He unhinged his jaw and swallowed him whole. And while she screamed, he shit on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> the horror turned into to ferocious anger. Who's yeah, going to wash yeah. that? <laughs> How dare you eat my kids and shit on my bed? You <laughs> son of a bitch. But like I said, this the belief that in the reality of, of this thing existed until the late 1800s. And, and what really turned it around was there's a Swedish folklorist, folklorist and I'm totally going to butcher his name, so 
for any Swedish listeners we have, I I very much apologize. But his name was Gunnar Olaf Hilton Kavip Kavip Gunnar Olaf Hilton Cavalius. Well done. I bet and, you that's pretty close. Yeah, let's maybe we'll see. But he was a Swedish folklorist folklorist um who lived throughout the 1800s he he died in in 1889 but um in the mid 19th century he was going around Sweden collecting stories from uh, different people who said that they had encountered um these giant snakes and some of the reports were saying that the giant snakes had a long mane around the head and there were others that said it had clawed forelegs like the tatsel worm or the lindworm that's interesting because i was going to ask you in there aren't there some scandinavian dragons that are described as having cat-like faces yeah yeah and the, and the tatsel worm is one of those that's said to have a cat face i wonder what they mean by that because they often use i mean in, in tons of cases all over the world animals to describe something that they can't understand or that they haven't right. seen before very much yeah, like, like Loch Ness and, and the Jersey Devil said to have horse heads. Right, exactly. And I wonder Yeah. I mean if, To me, I'm I'm guessing it probably had like protrusions like whiskers and probably some sort of point that looked like cat ears on its head, but they weren't horns. Right, right. Probably some sort of frills or something. I'd be way less scared of it. I mean imagine one coming around the corner and roaring like a dragon and versus going around the corner and having one just be like rear, rear. Yeah. meow meow <laughs> yeah I'd be like oh, oh shit. who's a who's a good lid worm who's a good you want some belly work you want some belly work <laughs> yeah but but this dude ended up getting around 50 witnesses um to report their sightings and in 1884 he actually offered a cash reward for anyone that would that could bring in a specimen, whether it was living or dead. And no one obviously came forth. And, and for some reason, even though he was offering up money for this, he ended up becoming ridiculed by other scholars um, because no one came forward to claim his reward, which seems weird because it's, you know, it's not like he's out there claiming that it's real. He's just saying, hey, I've got all these people that reported seeing it. And I'm offering a cash reward if somebody can bring me proof of its existence. Like, I don't understand why he would be ridiculed for that. But Right. But after no one was able to come forward with proof of its existence, despite the cash reward, um, the rumors of, or the sightings of the, the lindworm kind of faded out of existence. And now it's just a thing of legend. Ah. Uh. He ruined it. Maybe they got mad for him challenge, challenging their cultural stories, history. But he wasn't like amazing randying the shit, right? He was just like, hey, if you see one, I'll pay you. No, yeah, he was He was a folklorist. So he was just going around collecting local legends, and he heard about this, and people believed in it. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about two other stories. Um, one is probably familiar to most people. And I, I can't recall if we, we talked about it on the show before or not. Maybe we talked about it in passing. I don't really, I mean, we've been doing this shit for fucking what? Eight years now. Yes, sir. Yeah. So we've covered a lot of stuff and I've, and I've said many times on the show that I am prone to forgetting things that we've covered. And oftentimes I'll be like, hey, Mateo, let's cover this. And I'll be like, oh, asshole, we did this two years ago. And I'll be like, <laughs> ah, shit. So if I covered this before, I'm just going to cover it quickly because a lot of people are familiar with the legend. But it's a legend of St. George and the Dragon. And um, this takes place in uh, the third century. And uh, the story comes out of Libya. And ba the, the basic premise for, of the story is that the area of uh, Silene was under, I, I, I don't want to say under attack, but it was kind of, it was being terrorized by this dragon um, that lived in the swamp around the area. And it was a, it was a winged dragon 
with a long tail and dark green scales that resembled a crocodile scales. And it would come out of the swamplands and it started filling the countryside with its, its, it would breathe out these toxic clouds of, of poisonous gas from its mouth. And it would, it smelled terrible and everything it touches, it would wither and die. So in order to appease the dragon, uh, the, the local farmers would start feeding the dragon two sheep every day. But eventually, they ran out of sheep. And once they ran out of sheep, dragon was back at it, coughing up its gas and, and choking all, all life in the area. It would cause any living animal to choke and die. It caused plants to wither and, and rot. Um, but seeing it, they now had no livestock. They didn't have anything to offer it. So the king of Silene decided that they would sacrifice one child a day oh, trying shit. to appease the, the hunger of this dragon. Why a kid? Why not an old person, you dig? Because kids are tender and delicious, Mateo. He's all, Everybody I'm, knows it. I'm an old person, you dick. Yeah. <laughs> you can't send a king to die. But he he was hoping that this would buy them time until they could find someone who would be willing to, to kill this dragon. And days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months, and, and all the children in the village had been eaten except for the king's daughter. Oh. So the day came when he had to sacrifice his own daughter. And all this time, the village had been praying to God to save them from this beast. Please send, send someone to save us and, and kill this monster. And finally, on that day, when his daughter was to be killed... Uh, this this guy walks up in gleaming white armor, we're wearing uh, a red cross. Like picture a, a Templar knight, basically, like what you would what you'd think of a Templar knight from the Crusades looking like. And that's that's Saint George. Okay. And he rolls up, talks to talks to the princess, and realizes she's being sacrificed to this dragon. And he's like, you know what? Fuck that. I'm gonna take out this dragon. And uh. He had, he introduced himself to her, and his name was George. He was he grew up in Turkey in a place called Cappadocia, and he became uh, a soldier in the Roman army before he converted to Christianity. And now he was journeying the area, spreading the word of God. And he viewed this dragon as like a, a physical representation of evil in the world, and so he had to. It, he felt like it was his duty as a warrior of God to, to put an end to this beast. Right. So uh, he had, he'd fought in, in many battles at this point, but he'd never faced anything like this. So finally, when he comes face to face with it, the thing charges at him and, and he just, he can't help but feel like disgusted by the fact that such an evil thing actually exists in the world. And it crawled out of the swamp towards him and it was dripping with, swamp ooze and it just smelled and was gross and uh in in some of the legends he it's described as smelling like rotting meat Ugh. yeah dumpster dragon yep but uh george went to strike it with his lance and he was about to just ram his lance down the dragon's throat when all of a sudden these lumps on the side of its neck opened and it it had like this weird like psychedelic hypnotic effect on him and he became dazed and and saw all these glowing orbs surrounding him what the fuck but he was able to kind of concentrate despite seeing all of these colored orbs surrounding him and he just stabbed his lance straight through the middle of where these orbs were and it ended up that he impaled the thing through the back of the neck. So he, he his lance went through its mouth and came out the back of its neck. And then its wings fell down on its body, and then it died. Now, for a story that's passed down as legend and, and just that a story, that's awfully detailed. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, he's thought to be a Christian martyr, too. So, but it, I mean, 
is this something that's part of uh you know christian mythology and legend or or is this an actual historical being right symbolism or an actual creature yeah Yeah. well i mean if he was able to put a lance through its mouth out the back of its head it's obviously not a giant fire-breathing dragon maybe something more like the tatzel worm i don't know you describing the tatzel worm with the no legs and stuff it almost sounds aquatic itself doesn't it yeah i could i mean maybe or maybe it's like a weird fucking slithery snake Sal- salamander-esque I, yeah yeah but i got i got one more story and i saved the absolute best for last yes this this story takes place in the time of queen elizabeth the first in england uh outside of yorkshire village uh or outside of the village of wortley in yorkshire um there's a lodge called Wantley, and inside that lodge lived a dragon. And the dragon was, according to legend, an asshole. It would knock down trees, it would eat the cows, uh, the dairy cows, and it was just basically a dick to all the people in the area. Um, So the villagers, not knowing what to do, approached this local knight, Sir Moore of Moorhall. And uh, he he's kind of a, a local celebrity known as a great warrior, and, and they begged him to go fight this dragon. So Sir Moore agrees, but only if on the evening before the battle they find a fair-skinned woman with dark hair who would be presented to him to perform the duties of anointing his body with oil and dressing him in the morning. Hmm. And so... All, all the, all the ladies in the area that, that met that description, uh, tried to persuade the vi- village elders that they were the ones who would be, who should be worthy to, uh, attend to, to Sir Moore and anoint his body and dress him in the morning. Um, but Moore ended up traveling to a village called Sheffield, where he met with an armorer. And he asked for a very specific type of armor. Now, th- this is kind of similar to um, the other story where armor was commissioned with spikes. But he commissioned armor to create an entire suit that was covered with six-inch spikes. And it was said to look like a porcupine. So he, he, the armor builds the armor. Sir Moore puts it on, rides back to Wantley wearing his his armor and goes to sleep in Moorhall, ready to meet this woman who uh who had finally been chosen by the village elders and the legend says that the woman was presented to him and he he didn't end up emerging until a quote disgracefully late hour <laughs> and he seemed very weary the following morning huh so he he had he had a long night with this maiden apparently. Apparently the uh the anointing went a little long, maybe. <laughs> you gotta put that oil everywhere. Yeah. yeah. I got some use for that oil, baby. <laughs> That's dragon so, oil. Because he was so tired in the morning, the next morning, uh the the villagers thought that they had it was their duty to help invigorate him. So they gave him six pots of ale, oh. which he guzzled down and then went off to fight the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your courage juice. Now get to it. Yeah. So, th- so the dude spent all night having, having dirty sex with, th- with this woman. I- I- I'm sorry, being anointed with oils all night long. <laughs> and, then, and then gets up in the morning, tired, gets drunk. And then goes and rides off on his horse to fight the dragon. Okay, this guy, the, the way this, it depends on the way the story goes, but he could end up being the most badass knight ever. Yeah. Oh, it gets better. It gets way better. So he knows, because the villagers told, told him where this dragon typically goes to uh, drink in the morning. And it's this, this well outside of town. So he rides to the well and... 
went and hid inside of it. And finally the dragon arrives and as it's getting ready to drink, he jumps out and socks the dragon in the jaw. <laughs> <laughs> Just jumps out of the wall and bah Let's look. And uh the <laughs> God, this story rolls. So the, the he punches the dragon in the jaw, and the dragon is startled by this sudden attack <laughs> and kind of irritated flies back and, and goes, what the fuck it ends up turning and shitting in his direction oh no so now more is pissed off because the thing is shitting at him so he engages in battle with this dragon and they go back and forth back and forth and because of his armor being covered in spikes, the dragon's not able to, to do any harm to him. It keeps trying to attack him, not able to attack him. But the dragon is covered in these thick scales, so his attacks aren't able to hurt the dragon. So the battle goes back and forth for two and a half days. Holy they fought. shit. And finally, they Moore was starting to get tired. He ended up grabbing the dragon and... He, he got it in a headlock, basically, and pushed it so that it was turned around so that it was facing away from him now. And the villagers told him that this creature did have one weak spot. And in order to, to test whether or not this weak spot existed, he had to turn it around so that it was facing in the opposite direction. You, you mean bend it over? Correct. <laughs> Sir Moore then raised his spike-encrusted boot and kicked it directly into his ass. <laughs> the dragon began to scream, and it jumped into the air. It turned around six times, then collapsed onto the ground. And for a few minutes, it laid on the ground, thrashing and shaking. But finally, it ceased its shaking, shat again, <laughs> and then died. Oh, my God. On the way back, Sir Moore stopped to get a new jar of anointing oil and then went back to his woman attendant. Holy shit, he is the most dope knight ever. Yep, yep. He kicked Sir a Moore, the kicker of asses. Oh, literally. my God. Sir ass kicker. Mm-hmm. He kicked a dragon to death. He kicked its ass to death. <laughs> right in the anus. From what it sounds like, I'm sorry. It caused an best. involuntary fecal movement that was mm -hmm. probably directly in the turd cutter. Yeah, yeah. He kicked it so hard with a spiked boot, it shat and died. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, that's that's medieval dragon fight in life, you know? Sometimes you get shat on by a dragon. But hey, you get to go home and get anointed with oil by by your raven haired beauty. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll endure the risk. You may yeah, they're interview yeah. him. He's like, yeah, they do that sometimes. Yeah, in my experience, you always got to be careful, little dragon shit. You know, <laughs> it happens. You go, you get in a dragon fight. You go to kick the dragon, get a little shit on your shoe. It's just it, it happens. <laughs> it's not a big deal. It's like an MMA fight. It happens every once in a while. <laughs> Kick a guy just right in the gut, he shits himself. Kick a dragon in the ass, you're bound to get shit. <laughs> it just happens. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram.
iTunes and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast? Get yourself a WhatCast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in Homie's page. All this and more can be found at www.thewhatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.